The murder of Norma Jean Aids is one of the most challenging investigations I've ever been involved in. We were first invited into this case four years after the homicide, and to start at that point, beginning an investigation is very difficult. Things were just not what they seemed to be. It looked like someone was going to get away with murder. Baker, Florida. Firefighters arrive at the scene of a house in flames. Now I went to the back part of the house and, and entered. Uh, there was a lot of heat and smoke uh, in there. Volunteer crews scramble to save the home. In the front yard, a distraught Jimmy Yates arrives home from a school function and collapses in shock. His wife is still inside. Firefighters rush to the back bedroom. They find Norma Jean Aits lying on the floor. I saw the, the body laying there, uh, face down. I went to the head of the body and turned the body over and to uh, check for vital signs. And when I did, I saw the, uh, a, a wound in the heart area. And when her body, her back made contact with the floor, uh, we got a spurt of blood out of that. I could tell it was a small caliber wound. The autopsy reveals that Norma Jean Aids had been shot seven times with a 22 caliber revolver. For homicide investigators, the first question is obvious. Who would want to kill Norma Jean? We begin to look inwardly right close inside that house for a suspect, and then we try to expand that, the investigation outward from there, like working in concentric circles out from uh, the two people who live in the house. Jimmy Yates, Norma Jean's husband, is a popular high school teacher. He was at a graduation ceremony when the house started burning, so he has an airtight alibi. The fact that he was at school when it was reported as a fire and the fact that someone came and told him that your house is on fire looked real good for him, and it was very strong. Investigators begin to check out other leads, one person who intrigues them is Robert Money, Norma's nephew, who had just been released from prison for setting a fire. Investigators eventually decide there's not enough evidence to arrest Money, so they continue to pursue other leads. Witnesses said there was, just before the fire, there was a truck broken down on the north side of the Mr. H's property. If someone in that vehicle could have done the murder. But detectives failed to locate the mystery truck or its driver. Norma Jean's family must bury their daughter without knowing who killed her or why. Words can't express it, and I still can't. I can't tell you. It, it hurts so bad. She was, she just meant so much to us. Norma Jean Katarba and Jimmy Lee Yates grew up in Baker and married as high school sweethearts. He became a minister and later got a job as a teacher at Baker High School. Jimmy is close to Norma Jean's parents. He was crying during the night. He said, I reached to take her in on my arms and said she wasn't there. And he was just sobbing. But after months of digging, Detective Barbary has found no conclusive evidence tying anyone to Norma Jean's murder. The investigation hits a dead end. Four years later, under pressure from the relatives, the governor of Florida orders the investigation reopened. Special Agent Dale Hinman is brought in to profile a killer who so far has gotten away with murder. I've always been intrigued by puzzles. And when you look at profiling, profiling is a puzzle. Agent Hinman was the first female profiler in the state of Florida. Her specialty reading the evidence left behind at a crime scene, 
looking for clues that can answer the most basic questions in any investigation. How did the crime occur? How did the victim get selected from all victims who are potential in the world? Why that victim? Why on that date? Why in that location? Why that way? Four years after the murder of Norma Jean Ates, her killer is still at large. Agent Dale Hinman has been asked to revive the investigation. In order to create her profile, Hinman needs to understand how the attack unfolded. So she puts herself in the shoes of the victim and the killer. Dennis Haley is the new lead detective. He takes Agent Hinman for her first look at the crime scene. The first thing we saw was this, this damage to the door. This board here was damaged and was actually pushed in some. And uh, that's where we always felt the initial attack took place right here in the door. Well, probably what this means is that this is the first place in the house where the victim and the attacker came in contact and that she attempted to slam the door to barricade herself away from him. And then we had a bullet hole in that wall right there, just above the bed. Well, that would make sense if she was trying to close the door and he forced the door open at that time and fired. The first thing that strikes Hinman is that there is no sign of forced entry. And the first signs of struggle are found in the back of the house. This suggests that Norma Jean knew the person who killed her and felt comfortable allowing her attacker to follow her to the bedroom. And then Mrs. H ran to the, the bathroom. And we always felt that then the rest of the attack, or again, more of the attack took place in here. With the blood that's dropped in the bathroom floor, then it's obvious she was still standing at this point because you have blood that's dripped or dropped down to the floor. And then the next thing that happens is she exits the bathroom. Yes, she pushes by her attacker and is running and is trying to either run to get out the door or run to get to the phone. The phone was on the far back wall. The vicious nature of the crime convinces Hinman that this wasn't simply a robbery gone bad. Whoever attacked Norma Jean wanted to make sure she was dead. And then Mrs. Eights is actually found on the opposite side of the bed, lying right here with the prince's phone lying right next to her. She's got blood all over her hands. And at that point, because of one of the wounds on the back, on the back shoulder, it's like right in this area here, we felt like the coup de gras was right here. It, the round was fired right here. But the crime scene holds more secrets for Dale Hinman and her team to uncover. Everything in this crime scene from the first picture I saw looked like a staged crime. The first clue. In every room of the house, drawers had been pulled out and dumped onto the floor to make it look like a burglary. But Hinman is skeptical. If an individual was searching through these drawers, why not open them up and take what you want and then close it and go on to the next drawer? There wasn't any reason to empty the drawers out the way they were. To Agent Hinman, the fact that the killer shot Norma Jean seven times indicates an emotional connection to the victim. There was passion involved in this crime, possibly even rage. The autopsy also reveals that Norma Jean Aids was dead before the house fire started, suggesting a cover-up. It's not uncommon for people to try to conceal their crime by setting fire to a place uh, that has a dead body in it. Um, but as medical examiners, we're able to determine whether that body is alive at the time of the fire or deceased. Uh, there are telltale markings looking in the airway of the deceased, uh, finding soot uh, and uh, black carbon deposits from inhaling the products of combustion of the fire. But there are no carbon deposits in Norma Jean's lungs or blood, suggesting that the fire was staged. And investigators determined that it was set by placing a candle on a stack of newspapers, a crude timing device. 
An individual who wants the fire to have a delayed start does so that by the time the fire becomes a blaze, they can be long away from the scene and be somewhere else. So the fire needed to start at a later time to provide an alibi. A disturbing theory begins to take shape in Hinman's mind. Everything she has learned about the killer points to the man nobody wants to believe could have done it, Norma Jean's husband, Jimmy. But he's not the only suspect. Norma's nephew, Robert Money, who has a history of arson, is still on the list. And investigators still want to know more about the mystery truck seen parked outside the Eights house the night of the murder. Until they found the people that had actually broke down out in, in front of the, the Eights home that night, until they found who they were and, and determined what actually happened that night, these people could have been the actual murders. Coming up next, a trip to the graveyard and a crucial telephone call help investigators narrow their list of suspects in the murder of Norma Jean Eights. After four years, investigators still have a number of suspects in the murder of Norma Jean Eights. But police still have many unanswered questions and are frustrated by their lack of progress. With three potential suspects, Agent Hinman and her team are back at square one. To narrow their list, they decide to establish a detailed timeline of the moments leading up to Norma Jean's death. The cornerstones of their painstaking reconstruction, telephone records. What's the first time that you have on your timeline? Well, it's 6 o'clock. We have Mrs. Eights okay. talking to her sister-in-law. During that conversation, Mrs. Eights stated she was going to go to the graduation ceremony. And she's waiting on, waiting on her husband to get ready. Investigators conclude that at 6 p.m. on the night of the murder, Jimmy Eights was still at home with his wife. At 6.25, we have the 911 call. Mrs. Eights is found lying on the floor with the phone right next to her hands. This 911 call from the victim is crucial, giving investigators an approximate time for the murder. So certainly the crime had already begun for her to be calling 911. Exactly. And that there's blood on the phone, there's blood on her hands. When Norma Jean speaks to her sister-in-law at six o'clock, both she and Jimmy are in the house. 25 minutes later, Norma Jean has been shot several times. The question is, who was in the house besides the victim at 625? In light of the new timeline, lead investigator Dennis Haley decides to take another look at the statements of everyone associated with the case. When I reopen the investigation, I review all the Sheriff's Department's reports and, and uh, I go back and I, I redo several of the interviews, especially the important interviews. The imp interviews, the people who were last saw Mrs. Eights alive. One of those in interviews was with Robert Money. Norma Jean's nephew claims to have been home with his mother at the time of the shooting. But family member alibis are always suspect. Robert Money was on probation or had been on probation and it was uh, against the law for him to have a gun. He admitted to us that uh, he did, in fact, have possession of a 22 pistol revolver. The exact same type of gun that was used to kill Norma Jean Eights. Investigators now have a prime suspect. We asked him to take a polygraph. He agreed to take a polygraph. And not that a polygraph can be used in court, but we use it as a tool to see if, if we, an individual is telling us the truth. Robert Money had problems with the first initial polygraph. After failing the polygraph test, Robert Money surprises investigators with a startling confession. He admits, well, I did have a gun. It's a 22 revolver, and now I'm scared that that gun might have been used. Money also admits that upon learning he was a suspect, he buried the gun in a nearby cemetery. When we took Robert Money to the cemetery, he walked over to the edge of the cemetery to where there was a line of trees, buried not, it wasn't very deep, but buried under a bunch of leaves and sticks. We, we uncovered a, a gun wrapped in a, in a cloth. Next on Body of Evidence, a ballistic test on Robert Money's gun. 
Was this the weapon that killed Norma Jean Ates? The investigation of Norma Jean Ates' murder is now focused on Robert Money, an ex-convict and nephew of the family. He has led investigators to a gun buried in a cemetery. Physical evidence is the best kind of evidence to have. It was wonderful when Robert Money led Dennis Haley to the cemetery to recover the gun. Now we had something to work with. We could send this to the lab and determine if this was the gun that was used. A ballistic test will determine if Robert Money's gun killed Norma Jean Ates. Every gun leaves unique marks on the bullets as they pass through the barrel. The technicians are looking for a match between a bullet fired from Robert Money's gun to the bullets recovered at the crime scene. You can see the firing pin impression is entirely different in the two, and the overall markings are a lot different. In conclusion, we were determined that that particular fired cartridge case was not fired in this particular firearm. Investigators have hit another dead end. The ballistic test was back and it was negative. Robert Money's gun did not kill Norma Jean Aids. Now the suspects were back to Jimmy Aids and the driver of the pickup truck that was broken down in front of the house and the case was about to break wide open. Hoping to generate new leads, investigators plaster the town of Baker with reward posters. Finally, this strategy pays off. Long, they had to be considered as suspects, but once they were identified and interviewed, we knew they had no motive for this crime and their stories checked out. But the couple is about to become vital to the investigation as witnesses. Ron and Judy Nicholson said that they broke down on the road near the Eights residence. Mr. Nicholson walked down to a convenience store and called his friends to ask for assistance. After the call, Nicholson says he walked back down the road towards his vehicle, where his wife is waiting. Moments later, he saw Jimmy Yates come out of the house. To figure out the exact time Nicholson saw Yates leave the house, Agent Haley performs a simple experiment. Telephone records indicate that Nicholson left the convenience store at 6.09. Haley now retraces Nicholson's route back to the Yates home to see how long it took. From the convenience store to Mr. and Mrs. Yates' house is about an 18 minute to 20 minute walk. We figured that put Mr. Nicholson here at the driveway approximately 6.27 p.m. that night. And that's two minutes after the 911 call. And two minutes after Norma Jean died, So what that means is Jimmy Aids was back at the house at the time of the assault. So that narrows our suspect list from three to one. The timeline has paid off. Investigators now know who was in the house when Norma Jean was killed. Her husband, Jimmy Aids. This man was the person who murdered her, who faked being grief-stricken in front of the home and who moved in with them after the homicide and all along he knew he was the one who did this. Seven years after the murder, Jimmy Yates finally goes on trial at the Okaloosa County Courthouse. Remember, this is a man whose alibi was for a long time looked like it was impenetrable. Here's a man who I think believed that the whole town was his alibi that he had left the high school, he had run into his car, he had gotten to the scene and he had broken down in the yard. There are pictures of him being restrained in the yard. My wife, my wife is inside. It looked uh, airtight for a while for him. But the timeline developed by Agent Hinman and her team changed all that. The timeline was a disaster for him. He absolutely could not account for himself during certain critical periods of time. The phones locked him into things he could not deny. With the timeline placing Jimmy in the house at the time of Norma Jean's death, it takes a jury only four and a half hours to reach a verdict. Jimmy Lee Yates is found guilty of first-degree murder 
and sentenced to life in prison. I feel like he done it. I mean, it's just no, and I may be wrong, and I ask God to forgive me if I am, but I feel like that it was just lust and greed that did it. No one really knows why Jimmy Yates wanted Norma Jean dead, but there's no doubt that he killed her in a cold-blooded, calculated way. It's hard to understand that a husband could take his own wife's life, but we let the crime scene tell the story, let the evidence speak for itself in the scene. You can't change what happened to the victim. This victim that you're looking at in each of these cases is already gone, and there's nothing you can do to bring them back. But if you can listen to what they say in this scene, and you can interpret all of these events and make it mean something, then you can punish the person who did this.